The Meet Magic meetings compared to the other meetings that we have, I have thousands of meetings literally. And at the end of a 45 minute meeting, I've helped sick kids at the Starlights Children's Hospital, which is my chosen charity. And when you're first meeting someone, you're trying to build a connection. And with Meetings for Good, you just find the connections automatically there. And when I actually think about what Meet Magic does and the opportunity to spend some time supporting the community of our vendors, but also being able to give back. And when the opportunity presented itself to join Meet Magic, I jumped at it. But these ones are different. And the reason they're different is because the vendor wants to meet with you and they're willing to put their money where their mouth is. All of those meetings blur into one, but meeting for good is memorable. It absolutely makes sense to, to do this, and I definitely recommend peers to, to engage with that magic. How good is that? I love it when um, those execs talk like that. And, you know, Sean Miller, when Sean Miller, the CTO of Stockland, joined us, I literally sat back in my chair and punched the sky because it was like a big win. And Sharmila has become one of our huge advocates. And, and Paul Keane, clearly, and Dave Cowan, you guys are just complete legends in, in my world and can't help but thank you both all enough because you've, you've helped us get to where we are today. And for those that don't know, um, I was raised, I keep saying this, I was raised in multiple council houses in the 70s. Uh, that was back in the late 1900s. Let that sink in for a minute. Um, the late 19 <laughs> shit, I sound old. The late 1900s in the 70s, with my Ruth Tyler dad, who married a Jamaican lady. She had four kids of her own. I was the only white one, and I left school at 15. I left home at 16. Um, I've had I've got no qualifications at all. Not a single exam have I passed. I don't, my daughter does them. I don't even know what she does in them. Um, but my name is Carl, and I'm the founder of this purpose-led platform as a service called Meet Magic. And what we are is a platform that gives executives an opportunity to give back just by doing what they do every single day, which is meetings, discovery meetings, connecting with vendors and those sorts of things. So this Magic Room podcast really is all about purpose-driven leaders and giving them a chance to share their journey. It's for the change makers, but it's also my way to share their story because like me, everyone's got one. And this podcast theme is all about them. It's about what inspired them growing up. It's not about their work. It's about their mentors, what, who, who are their mentors. It's about their vision for the future and, and how they give back now because I think a lot of execs right now are looking for ways to give back, don't have time to go volunteering at the shelter, but they got time for a meeting that, that's going to do some good. So if you're a leader and you want to give back and you want to be on our show, I'll put a link in the podcast uh, in, the, in the notes and you can – there's a little test in there called the Magic Mind Card and it's really to, it's designed to see if you're really um, – led leader really because if you're not we don't really want you on the show um so we've got some exciting podcasts coming up i think in a couple of weeks we've got the um the, C the cio of, of one of the universities here talking with some uh, with some guys who come out of the nbm which is a national broadband network um talking about ai and some of the stuff that's happening in the government world but now i'm very pleased um to introduce patricia now i'm gonna try and get patricia's name right here because um wisniewska i think is correct i'm probably going to get called out here patricia welcome it's pretty well <laughs> carl patricia wisniewska oh it's what good morning good morning how does how do you pronounce it wisniewska good lord wisniewska and where's where's that from let me guess. I am Polish from origin, born and raised in Poland. So that's why uh, the spelling of Patricia is slightly different and uh, Wisniewska, which is a quite common Polish surname. My biological mother's name is Patricia. And I had a crush on a Polish girl growing up. <laughs> <laughs> and her name was Joanne. And I met her when, when my dad and I were tiling a Polish lady's roof. And all I, I learned one word, Chindobri, that, that was it. That was all I managed to learn out of the Polish Polish language. But one of my board members, his name's Andrew Madazak, and I can never even pronounce his surname, um, spell his surname because he's got too many S's and too many Z's in it. Um, but he's been, <laughs> he's been one of my big supporters and one of my best friends for 20-odd uh, years now, and all Polish. Drinks, drinks like a fish. Drink me under the table, and I don't even bother getting. I don't even bother trying. He's a current CTO of a big company here called Commonwealth Superannuation or something like that. 
Well, great to hear that they have some good experiences with uh, Polish people. And Dzień dobry. Yeah, I mean, nothing but good experiences, by the way. I mean, this is, this is. I don't think I have ever had one negative experience with anybody from Poland. There must be something about the country and the way people are raised there that it's it, it's just a good culture. But this is all about you. And I, I mean, Poland, but now you're living, of course, in Singapore. And it looks like it's still dark there. It's not dark, is it? Uh, it's uh, it's not actually it's uh, quite bright and I guess uh, that the camera is trying to correct for the massive amount of sunlight we're getting uh, today in Singapore. <laughs> well, we've got, <laughs> we've got some amazing supporters in Singapore. Um, there's a, in fact, I've got a WhatsApp group here on my phone. There's about a hundred executives in that group, and some amazing leaders. Um, I think the CEO of Maybank is in the group. Um, there's lots of banks from, I think, Standard Charter, UOB, uh, all the all the big brands are in there. I think even I think even the founder of of uh, Airwallex is in the group as well, which is kind of a fintech. Now, I think you're so let's get, let's get back to you and, and, and your background. So you're currently the chief operating officer of um, a blacksmith. Do you want, maybe just tell us about a little bit about who you are and what you're doing at the moment. Uh, sure. Um... I am, uh, yes, I am an uh, exiting uh, COO and head of product of uh, Blacksmith KYC because Blacksmith has been recently acquired by Encompass, which is a leading uh, KYC, nor your customer uh, technology provider. Uh, so um, a few weeks left to finish up uh, the migration and integration of the few, few systems. Um, and then I'll be uh, closing, uh, closing the, that chapter. Well, uh, it's been uh, five years since I relocated to Singapore. Uh, I relocated for a blacksmith KYC, which was back then an idea, a problem which has been flagged uh, by several banks saying um, KYC process due diligence of our corporate clients is a time consuming process. It requires documentation, back and forth exchanges of emails. Uh, between our KYC analysts and the clients. And of course, this is all taking us further away from closing business and making deals. So there was the definite need uh, for a solution. And I came here uh, to lead the development uh, of this idea to move the service, uh, make the service design implemented, form the team, uh, and now uh, successfully scale this uh, startup and, uh, and exit. Wow. I mean, that's. That in itself is mind-boggling. When I think about how I know, I know what we've gone through to get a, get something off the ground, and you so it's now in scale mode. And yes, yes, it's it's scale mode. Actually, uh, we got adopted pretty uh, early uh, by ING globally, and uh, I think if everything was accelerated by COVID. So uh, at the end of 2019, we had the first version of our. MVP, minimum viable product. So basically a solution, all right, that was working. Uh, we were collecting data from external service providers such as uh, Moody's and Swift and Banker Salmanac and collecting mm -hmm. this data to form customer due diligence uh, files uh, for banks. Um, and while we we're still testing and doing the pilots, COVID kicked in, people started working from home and there was a sudden need for the companies and for the employees to have some solutions that would allow them to work remotely. So suddenly the old ways of working where you could print documents or uh, get mails and handle them uh, in a manual way on your desk where we're not available anymore. So um, COVID accelerated the adoption of Blacksmith. And it was a very, yeah, a crazy moment because, uh, you know, getting a solution from MVP to bank grade technology requires, um, yeah, a investing in uh, security <laughs> and authentication, a lot of work, right? And documentation of all this. Um, and, and we did that. We did that in, in six months. Uh, so very oh. proud of it, uh, what we achieved with the team and that we're able to uh, scale internationally with our solution. It's incredible. When I think about it, six months is nothing. When you think about I, I, my, my, one of my sales jobs that I had years ago was in a company called Extra Hot, and they were just cybersecurity stuff. They were basically analyzing packets on the wire so you can determine whether or not there was any cybersecurity attacks and incidents just to get a, a proof of concept, not even in production, to get that in the development side of the bank was like a six month process. And you went from from basically a, a minimum viable product to getting that within six months. That's that's incredible. 
I mean, for, for those that don't know, why don't you just explain what KYC is? Because I think it's it, it's this term that's come around and everyone's it, it's quite popular now, but it wasn't around a few years ago. What is it right. KYC is for them? Right. KYC means know your customers. So I think every single person and individual came across KYC when you try to open a bank account. The bank mm -hmm. will ask you some questions. What is your name? Where do you live? Where is your tax residency? Um, do you own accounts in other banks? What is your source of wealth? Do you have a legitimate uh, source of wealth? To make sure, basically, that first of all, you are you. You are the real person. You have the identity. That you are not a sanctioned person. And that you are not uh, trying to launder money. And the same mm -hmm. applies in corporate KYC, which is now called more KYB, know your business. So when a bank tries to do business with a company or with another financial institution, they also must understand what kind of company they are dealing with, what kind of customer that is. So yeah. is this company, does this company really exist? What does the shareholder structure look like and a subsidiary structure? Is there exposure to some, what the bank would consider high risk countries? And also to double check whether the company is not uh, involved in final, uh, in terrorist financing or money laundering activities. How on earth did you get into this? Because this this sounds all very complicated. Because or is there something that you, when you were growing up you go, oh, okay, I want to go and I want to go and help solve these sorts of problems. How do you get influence to do this? Was it just tech related that, that inspired you? Uh, it, it was it was rather in. Um, coincidence because i only got into kyc about uh, five years ago for for blacksmith uh, my background is in uh, digital uh, transformation and digital product management so when i started working uh, for img bank as a management trainee many years ago i think more than 15 years ago in amsterdam i get very interested in how can a bank become a modern bank how a bank can improve customer experience and how this can be done digitally and we're talking here 15 years ago, right? So it's a world where all the payments had to be done in actual bricks and mortar uh, bank branch and uh, everybody had their Nokias uh, and, and, and that was it. So, so the uh, adoption of digital tools to access banks was not there yet. But I was looking on the spokes of the organization where I could do something with digital. And I found one in Belgium, the early days digital uh, banking department uh, where there were just ideas to, to build a mobile banking app and the in the late later in that what we delivered was was amazing we basically put up a mobile banking app tablet app uh, full-fledged digital channels with uh, uh, products and services that the customers could self-serve online um, you know, when I'm talking about that right now, this doesn't sound like innovation. This is something that all banks must offer to the retail customers and business customers and even private banking customers. Mm. But 10 years ago, that was all innovation. And um, I, I continued this journey in digital transformation of the bank, uh, later going in the replacement of core banking systems um, and building this uh, digital interaction with the customers. And that led me to the project in Singapore, which was the development of this uh, rec tech solution, Blacksmith KYC. That's just incredible. What a, what a journey. I mean, you just don't think about it. I'm, a, I'm 54 the next, shit, next month. So 50, wow. I'm 54. So I was born in the 70s. Uh, I, I, I mentioned that in the introduction, the late 1900s. When you, when you say it in those sorts of words, it makes you sound really old because it was the late 1900s when I was born. 1970s is the late 1900s. Mm -hmm. Technology wasn't around. You mentioned Nokia phones. So you've obviously been around since then. <laughs> yes. And can, remember, <laughs> and can remember those that those sorts of times. The distance traveled between there and know your customer now is incredible. Mm -hmm. I get the sense that a lot of banks are still behind when it comes to those things like um, the point system, that, that, that 100 point validation check that you've got to go through. Um, mm -hmm. I still think that. I, I can never get approved uh, for some reason. I, I, my, my past, where where I was struggling as a as a desperate person trying to survive in life, um, I get this black mark against my name, and now all of a sudden I can't get approved for anything. I feel like it's not kept up with with how people are living. Do you, I mean, okay. is, is, is know your customer meant to solve all that sort of problem as well? 
Um, well, it's not uh, meant to solve. So what I, I, I do hear what you're saying, because uh, I experienced that uh, myself when I was living, working in Belgium, had a mortgage in Belgium and tax residency in Belgium. It was all easy and contained. And the program started kicking out when I relocated to Singapore, because suddenly you, you are in several countries, then Belgian regulators sent me a message. What are you doing? Are you, why are you in Singapore? Why do you have an account there, which you didn't declare? Are you trying? I was like, I'm working here. I have legitimate uh, business purpose. So uh, on the one hand, you see that uh, there are some, 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 you know, there's a need to cut for the banks to catch up on this uh, international presence of people. At the same time, this creates opportunities, right? So all the problem can be opportunities. So you have uh, many for retail customers, many, um, digital banks uh, that have just an entity in, in some country like Lithuania or some some other country which allows them to operate, um, say say Revolut uh, for example, um, and and they give accounts to people in different locations. Still, they must perform no customer because you don't want to give accounts to uh, people to criminals no. who try to launder money. What I see a trend there is a centralization of certain activities. So, uh, for example, in the European Union, there is this Belgian solution called uh, It's Me, which um, uses uh, the banking system and also uh, smart technology behind uh, document uh, verification to authenticate that you are you. So at least this part of the problem to identify um, that uh, I am Patricia Wisniewska and I am held the passport from Poland with this number. Uh, this part can be outsourced to companies that are already specialized in that. The part that is related to um, your, your behavior and whether a bank wants to give you a loan or not, this is something that remains uh, uh, in on basis of a client relationship. It's nuts, Patricia. And I, I say this because my original bank that I was dealing with, one of the big four here, when I started the whole Meet Magic journey, there was no money around, but I, I had to have a bank account. So I got the bank account. And then all of a sudden, our revenue went from naught to 250,000, from 250,000 to a million. And then all of a sudden, I'm thinking, well, I need a credit card. Let me go and get one. And I couldn't get one because they they still got my records from 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 twenty years ago when I was really poor or whatever, um, and and so this whole know your customer thing became into my into my vision and I had to go through this process of of, of getting trying to get approved and it was really difficult. It wasn't it wasn't simple at all. And so I just I just wonder. I, I think that there's so much there's some there's so many people out there that are struggling now and I, I look at the banks and I know for example one of the banks here lost their CEO a couple of years back because they, the money was being siphoned off to, to supporting pedophilia or something and they didn't know where that money was going and it's coming in the country and it was just a mess. I mean, this is a, this this happens today with money laundering and everything else. It's How do you keep a track of that? I don't know, but you'd hope that KYC is a part of that and um, helps helps bring bring a bit of, bit of clarity. But um, where do you think it's all going to go? Because it's, I think... The more the more we keep implementing these things, the more the the, the the criminals and the people that are that are shifting the money around get smarter and smarter. I, for example, dumped my banks and I'm now all digital. I'm, I've gone all in on Lucy Lou's product called Airwallex. So we've got bank accounts in all different countries that we it's all digital, it's easy, it's simple, there's no fees to transfer and all that sort of stuff. And so it just works for us. But how is this all going to end up in the in, in the next five years? Do you think? I mean, KYC today. What is it tomorrow? I think it's a, a huge challenge. Uh, really huge challenge. One of the biggest challenges for for banks and regulators uh, at this point of time, because you see that. Uh, you know, like you said, 10 years ago, nobody was talking about KYC. Now KYC ends up everybody's mouth uh, because mm -hmm. the um, regulatory requirements for the banks increased uh, massively in the last 10 years. There were a number of huge fines, huge fines to large banks. Also in Australia, I think most of the large banks have been fined in the last uh, five years for um, yeah, just 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 some gaps uh, or perceived gaps in uh, anti-money laundering uh, policies and KYC policies. There were those huge scandals uh, to, to name one uh, Wirecard. Wirecard was uh, the go-to solution in Singapore in 2019. 
but later it uh, figured out that uh, the ownership structure was uh, actually um, not uh, correct and because of that uh, there was a big uh, uh, scandal uh, arising from that so so look this is on uh, everybody's mouth but it's not an easy uh, challenge because uh, you, you know wh where do you draw the line like how deep you go in your investigation it is yeah. the is it the responsibility of the law enforcement uh, or or bank at some point of time right how much information do you you must collect on a person in order to to provide loan how, how deep do you go so um, yeah. it, it's a difficult challenge it's a very expensive challenge uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I think the only um, a solution or emerging thing I see is first of all I see banks investing more into buy solutions versus uh, bold. So there's always this uh, challenge, right? When you're when you want to address something in large corporate, you're saying, okay, do we buy or do we bold? I see a strong um, movement towards uh, buy because uh, the time to both advance technologies that are used using uh, AI. Uh, yeah. The time to build, uh, yeah, all, the, all these processes is just so complex that it's better to build, uh, to, to buy the market leader, uh, especially that now they are all on cloud. So it's very easy to integrate those cloud solutions in your own system. So you, you avoid this lengthy integration projects uh, that uh, would uh, fail. That's something that defined IT projects 10 years ago. You don't have those issues anymore. Yeah. And then second thing is I see lots of consolidation of uh, those uh, difficult competencies, uh, like, for example, identification and auto authentication of the users. So, for example, uh, modern solutions these days, if you want to do the login, you probably you will leverage some third party provider that is doing only that, that is only doing cybersecurity protection and verification of the login and is specialized in that thing. It's something that you can never beat with an um, in-house build solution. No, it's it, and, and the fact that they've got these legacy systems that are sitting there, these banking core banking systems that have been sat there for twenty years, putting putting you know agents, security agents on them is often very difficult, and you know separating things out is very 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 time and cost. I, I remember a conversation here I had with um, who was it? I think it was I think it was Commonwealth Bank. And this is something that's quite controversial. I think it was all it's all public knowledge. I think you can go and Google it. Um, but years ago, remember Square. Um, I think Jack Dorsey said that years ago, and then he came to Australia to try and sell it to the Commonwealth Bank. And this apparently was the, one of the biggest cases of corporate bullying ever. So the Commonwealth Bank, they were they were they were talking to Square for for many 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 months. I think it was eighteen months worth of conversations about how it works and everything else, and all this intellectual property was being shared. And then at the very last minute, the Commonwealth Bank said, "Oh, actually, we've changed our mind. We're not going to do this anymore." But secretly in the background, they've been building their own version of Square, taking mm. all the property and building their own. And they launched this thing called Albert. Now, this for me was was kind of crazy. And it, uh, but when, for them to go and actually build that was kind of easy because it's a, a, little, a little payments tool. But to go and literally replace core banking systems, that's just never going to happen. So you're going to buy stuff and put put things on top of it. So I think there's a that, that, that one conversation. I, I get scared when startups like you – Go into banks and share everything, knowing that it could actually just—it could end up falling over and not really going anywhere. So, how, how did yeah. you get around that sort of com? I mean, you must have had those conversations with blacksmiths. You must, you, when you go into a bank and you have these conversations, how do you protect yourself from getting? I don't know if you've watched the Silicon Valley TV show in in America. There's a TV show on Netflix called Silicon Valley, and I, this is I've heard of it. It's never seen. Yeah. You haven't seen it, but there's this, and you can find it on YouTube. This is not this is not meant to be dirty. It's called brain rape, and they basically take these founders into the boardroom and take all of their knowledge out of their brain and and, and take it for themselves. How did you stop that from happening with banks in Singapore? Because they're pretty they're pretty switched on up there. That's a very good question because you know what? Uh, back in 2019, I think before going any conversation would uh, bring an NDA. To the table and really make sure we protect everything and uh you know i think it made sense but at some point of time we just stopped doing that because uh the more uh technological advancements you get the more it is difficult to copy you 
uh, yeah. because it's especially for solutions that are quite complex uh, in what we are operating in B2B space. Those are really specialized solutions uh, where um, many yeah, Mondays of R&D were put in. Um, mm. It's also at this point of time when you also add the security layer and documentation layer that is required for bank grade technology. It is very difficult to copy you and it doesn't even make sense to copy you. If you want to make a solution that is really challenging your model, you need to pivot and build something that is addressing either a different problem or is so much more superior that takes you over. So. Um, yeah, I would say maybe I would even go earlier without NDA. Maybe we were even so protective in the first years <laughs> that we didn't leverage the opportunities with potential partnerships because we're so yeah. afraid of competing uh, with some uh, partners who could have been partners for us uh, and later became partners, right? But we could have sounded earlier if it wouldn't be so protected. It's kind of crazy. I, I, I often say that you've got to be open and transparent in these conversations, otherwise they just fall over. I remember at school as a kid, you'd often see the kids that were writing on their books and they'd hide their work like this and you, they wouldn't let you see. But the, the ones that said, hey, do you want to see my answers? They're the ones that got ahead <laughs> by, yeah. by sharing their, their, their knowledge. But the ones that hid everything didn't really get ahead too much. Well, let's go back to you again, rather than the tech and the, and the, the technology. Cause that's, it's all, all, all amazing stuff, but the, you know, the distance that the technology has come from, from when we started with nothing to where it is today. What inspired you growing up? Is there any, any one thing that stands out? Uh, yeah, um, well, uh, look, uh, I was raised in, what are they talking about, uh, where, where we come from, what the background was. So I was uh, born and raised in communist Poland in the 80s. So I think uh, I'm a first generation that had uh, much contact with uh, technologies. I got uh, my uh, first computer, Commodore 64, when I was uh, six years old, my uh, first communion in, in church, uh, Catholic church. So, so that was uh, the interaction. I was playing also some uh, Nintendo games, uh, end of 80s. And you know, when I was thinking who inspired me to go for international career, I think maybe a little bit controversial right now, but I think it was Margaret Thatcher. Yes, I was uh, I was watching TV with my grandma while I was watching uh, the news, and that was big news, end of 80s, end of communists, breaking of the Berlin Wall. And there was this mm -hmm. lady standing among these men, and this lady was powerful and opinionated, and I was uh, uh, leading one of the most powerful countries in the world, and I was like, Okay, that's cool. That's cool. She's uh, she's uh, impressing me. So, I was looking for a career that would be an international career, a career that uh, I wouldn't know whether I would go in a direction economics or um, international uh, relations uh, and, and politics. So that was always an area of interest for me. And in the end, it became um, uh, banking and, and startup world, which is also inspiring. But that's uh, that's a journey. You're in a great space. I mean, startups, startups, banking in Singapore goes hand in hand. I mean, you, there must be so much opportunity up there. I mean, Peter Kemp's, who's the, um, I think he's running Sequoia. I used to work with him. He, I think he was based in Singapore for many years. He's gone back to back to Holland now. But um, just the amount of work that he's got going on up there is it's kind of crazy. It's just there's so, there's so much opportunity. I, I often think Australia is very behind even though we're kind of advanced in, in things still it's just such a small market it's a tiny part of the world mm -hmm. um it's not a hub at all i think you look at singapore i, I see singapore as obviously a global financial hub because that's exactly what it is um and the opportunity there seems to be a lot more than, than down here I've got loads of friends up there but um so let's go back to how you give back right now i mean is is there is there something that that you're doing at the moment that's giving back to you to, to help inspire other women or other technology or other um, founders? Yes, absolutely. Look, it's also part of my work to to be connected. And, and the reason I like tech is because you can bring such a positive uh, impact uh, on uh, on society with the solutions that you're building. Um, so I am involved in a Belgium Luxembourg Chamber of Commerce because uh, my connection is uh, very strong with uh, Belgium where I worked for uh, and lived for 14 years. Uh, so through that organization, we started a mentorship program where we match uh, um, different mentors and mentees, help them grow. Um, I'm also uh, active in the uh, women's circles, women in IT, women in business, uh, trying to be this inspiration for 
uh, younger generation of ladies that uh, you know to, to be um, to be ambitious and uh, what to do to have a meaningful career. And I would say it's not only for men, women, right? That was a big thing ten years ago. I think now it's basically helping younger generations go faster and deliver value faster and uh, shape their career in a form that uh, they can grow professionally and also bring value to society. Yeah, you know, I, I, you think about how we started with tech when like, go back, there was nothing there. And you think about where it is today. That, that, that journey is obviously a great one. You, you, I think about the kids today, um, where, it, where technology is going to be in the next five or 10 years. Mm -hmm. Today with AI and you look at NVIDIA and what's going on with their chipsets and the speed of processing that they're getting up, we're going to start to see literally doubling of, that, of, the, of the transformation over the next couple of years. It's literally going to be that fast. I often think these kids are going to get left behind unless they put a stake in the ground right now and start to say, okay, I'm going to start looking at, for example, I don't know, transformation, pick a piece in transformation uh, and just, just start somewhere. Because once you're in, I think once you're on the, on the path, you, you can, you can actually moderate and twist and turn and go places where you want to go to and find what really, what really suits you. But until you take that step, that first step, nothing really is really going to happen. I think that's a great, it's a great place to start to give back. You know, um, maybe maybe you can start KYK, um, K, 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 know your KYK. So instead of KYK, know your customer, you can start know your kids. Know your kids. <laughs> <laughs> know your kids because no one knows what their kids are doing anymore. Um, <laughs> there's probably something new in there. But um <laughs> Yeah, yeah. and I think if, if you want to do that, you should definitely do that on Singapore because you're mentioning how great uh, that you heard that Singapore is a great place to develop technologies. And I uh, definitely thought that it's, um, you know, it's yeah. a great place because um, uh, on the one hand, Singapore is small. So uh, the space that you're operating in is small. All the large buildings, I see them from the window of my apartment, all this, uh, the financial center, the technological center, they are all located downtown. So it's very easy to schedule meetings with many people in a very short uh, piece of, uh, amount of time. Yeah. There's a great international airport. But basically, if you have a hub here in Singapore, within uh, two hours, up to four hours, you can basically move around in the whole uh, APAC, including Australia. So that's really a bit longer, eight hours exaggerating there, but uh, three, three hours to Perth. Yes, three hours to Perth. That's true. Um, and uh, it, it's just a uh, really great space. And you really see the uh, government is promoting technology, giving many mm. uh, grants, uh, creating also uh, for us, uh, creating uh, conferences uh, to make sure that the uh, uh, entrepreneurs come here and uh, and both create solutions well don't talk about conferences where we we say stop the conferences there's too many conferences there's too many uh, yeah uh, just, yeah just before, i see the fatigue yeah <laughs> just before covid hit there's so many conferences it's like conference fatigue and then covid two years of, of downtime and and then all of a sudden it came back and now it's like millions of conferences again. Cybersecurity conferences, my God. I mean, I, did, I just don't know how some of these CISOs get any work done because they spend all the time on stage talking. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it's kind of crazy. I, I, I just want to give a, a quick shout out to, to Dane Ma, who is a friend of mine who owns this company called MySizo.co. Um, and if, for anyone that's out there that's watching this, if you've got a security and a risk management, and you, if you think it's overly complicated, then what you can do is get the MySizo app and actually simplify the whole of your security management um, inside your company. So we're looking at it ourselves, um, but it's just a, if, you, if you can't afford a CISO to come and do it all for you, MySizo is this app that gets, gets you access to becoming compliant. So I, I, every company has got issues with compliance right now. And, it, and I think with regulations and the changes in regulations, and it's, it's, it's just going to get worse. I think pe people yeah. are... Cybersecurity is constantly changing. There's no way you can keep up with it. So uh, just a massive shout out to Dan. Keep going, my son. Uh, he's an Arsenal fan, um, Patricia. So don't, don't, don't hold that against him. I'm, I'm a Nottingham Forest supporter. Um, so anyway, that's that. Um, we've sort of come to the end, and I know we can keep going and talking a lot, but I, I normally finish these, um, these little chats with a few Socratic questions. I didn't even know what that word meant until I had to actually look it up. But they're just 
five questions that I'm going to ask you that you don't know about, and you've got to answer one or the other. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah, sure. Are you scared yet? Well, a bit, tension builds up. <laughs> okay. Give me a nickname that your first boy boyfriend called you. Nickname? Uh, 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 Snow Queen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even going to go there and ask why he called you that. Um, on a scale of one to ten, how good of a driver are you? Ten. <laughs> Do you respect Kanye West? I don't know who that is. Oh, you don't know who Kanye West is? Oh, that's incredible. Okay. So he was he was Kim Kardashian's husband for a while. Kim Kardashian's got two kids with him. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. He had a bit of a... Went a bit cuckoo in the head. And I think he ended up... He was a rapper, anyway. I think um, uh, you, you can infer from my from my answer that I'm not into that no. area of uh, this, interest. This one will be easy for you. Say something in an Asian language. Uh, what I need? Wow. It's, I, I love you in Chinese. Yes, yeah, <laughs> wow. You must have had that said to you a few times. <laughs> My, my kids have uh, Mandarin in school, so I'm uh, picking up a few things from uh, their songs. Uh, how old are they? Uh, six and nine. Oh, bless. Young age, two under ten. You're in good. And the final one, this is an interesting one, Salesforce or HubSpot? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I have a practical experience with Salesforce. Uh, I think uh, it, it's a good solution can be better. So uh, I will definitely experiment with HubSpot as a pilot to, to see uh, what benefits it can bring. Oh, that's interesting. So so I, I, I just had a meeting with Salesforce this morning. I was in there um, with a number of the execs in there. Um, Bill, I forget Bill's surname, but yeah, Bill Sullivan, was, who we met with, who I've just had, we've had a great experience with Salesforce. For some reason, I don't know why, but I think we're, we're an anomaly. But um, it's been really good. Patricia, thank you for being with us and thank you for spending some time with me. Um, I think your journey is quite remarkable. I think you've come from from, from somewhere that was, was really close to somewhere that's really even more close, really. I mean, Singapore is, you can't, you can't chew chewing gum on, throw it on the floor up there, or you get thrown in jail, but. But you're completely open as a person. <laughs> Very lucky. I love Singapore, especially that it's so clean. Although you cannot have uh, chewing gum. Yeah, is it true that they, they don't they don't they don't throw you in jail for having it? Do they? Is that no, is that a myth? No, no, no. Uh, it, it, it's just a uh, uh, clear um, stick. Uh, to give you the carrot of a very clean country and clean st uh, streets. And they are uh, chewing gums, but those are more like mental steps that uh, melt after some time to make sure that there are no things thrown on the floor. Um, I, I forgot to ask you about your dream job. What, what is, what's, a, what's a dream job for you? A dream job? Oh, uh, look, I throughout my career, I never set myself for a real job. It was more uh, finding the opportunities and see what gives me energy and where I can bring positive value. So I think in the future, I want to just uh, continue with that, uh, look for jobs where I can continue uh, growing myself, where I can continue growing older people and nurturing their potential, and where I also have the time for um, uh, exercise and family, because that's also an important part of who I am. It's so, it, it's probably the most critical part, I think. My daughter's 21 now, she's at university, so I don't see her that much, but we try and talk most days. and. But it's it's just so important. I think at the end of at the end of the day, when you're lying flat and you're about to die, nobody will care about the transformation project that you did. Nobody will care about the startup <laughs> that you had. You know, nobody will care about your money or your house or your car. Uh, it'll just be about the family and the ones that were close to you. That that is it. And, and three generations later, 
everyone will have forgotten you. So <laughs> I think when you start thinking in those terms, it, it's a short time that we're here and family really is um, probably the most important out of everything. I think if you, if you went and interviewed 100 old people that are on their last chapter and asked them what they consider, it would be family. It literally does. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. But I'm absolutely. wishing you a wonderful Wednesday. It's, it's hump day and you're so lucky to live in Singapore because you are literally half an hour from any country like Thailand and Bali and God knows what else. You can literally hop on a plane and go to another country for the weekend and go back. We can't do that from here. We've got to go to New Zealand for three hours. But it's not not quite the same as Bali or somewhere, but but it's um it's it, it's a great location, and I think the I think it's a fun playground as well. So um, have a great week ahead. Thank you very much, Carl. It was a pleasure talking to you. Pleasure. Talk to you soon. Bye.